The Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations, and Corporate Global Corporate Social Impact will come to order. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to our witnesses for being here today for our hearing entitled United States Leadership in the International Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to, to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address or contact full committee staff. Please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with remote committee proceedings of HRES 8, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they're not under recognition to eliminate any background noise. I see that we have a quorum, and I'll now recognize myself for opening remarks. Again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Three months ago, this subcommittee had its first hearing on the impacts of COVID-19 around the globe. Three months ago, the world was averaging near, nearly 420,000 new cases of COVID-19 every day. Today, that number is almost 450,000. This is a reminder that while we've had incredible success at home in the United States, the pandemic continues to rage outside our borders. Since the start of the pandemic, nearly 4 million people have died from this virus. And for the first time in years, extreme global poverty is on the rise. Global inequality, instability, and hunger have all been exa exacerbated by this pandemic. Meanwhile, here at home, we're making remarkable progress, as you all have witnessed. Since President Biden's inauguration and the start of this new Congress, cases of COVID-19 have dramatically de decreased from nearly 200,000 new cases on average to less than 15,000 cases per day now. American deaths are down from over 4,000 in early January to less than 500 a day now, and they're continuing to fall. Extraordinary progress, thanks to the American Rescue Plan and the American people's commitment individually and as a communities to defeat this pandemic. And with more than 40% of the American people vaccinated, it's clear that vaccines work. Yet the American people are still not secure despite this progress. New and dangerous, dangerous variants, such as the Delta variant, pose serious threats to our hard-won progress here at home. The United States must lead to end this pandemic. Fortunately, this Congress and this committee have acted by supporting over $10 billion in international in additional development and foreign assistance to end the pandemic and address its effects. And we have a vital partner in the Biden-Harris administration in this venture. Back in April, I said that the United States of America had to rise to the challenge and become the vaccine arsenal of democracy and provide the world with the tools needed to fight COVID-19, as we did during the Second World War in the struggle against fascism. I believe we need to leverage our full industrial and scientific capacity to manufacture and distribute excess vaccines, negotiate a waiver to World Trade Organization patent rules in order to speed global vaccine production, and reverse the losses in the fight against poverty that this pandemic has caused. The COVID-19 pandemic has had wide ranging consequences that we cannot ignore. And I wanna see the administration's plan, not just res to respond to the crisis, but on how we build back better, as the president has said. Our development work should have gains that are durable and sustainable, reversing the tragic growth in poverty and malnutrition and ensuring that once in a century pandemics do not become routine occurrences. We need to consider strengthening international organizations that will play a role in the long recovery ahead of us and reforming those today based on how they have performed during this crisis. Where necessary, we need to consider creating new multilateral institutions that reflect a post-world a post-pandemic post world. The United States response should also take into account the pandemic's effects on de democratic institutions. We're seeing authoritarian leaders like Viktor Orban in Hungary go beyond reasonable public health restrictions and use the pandemic as an excuse to crack down on political opposition. The pandemic has also disrupted the workforce of the State Department, USAID, and that of our allied nations and our implementing partners on fighting the pandemic. 
Our infrastructure for diplomacy and development needs to be rebuilt and where necessary, also reimagined. We need to be open to new ways of doing development where we incorporate new technologies and new practices. The increasing use of tools like development finance through the US Development Finance Corporation, for example, can build the foundations of the post-pandemic world. We need to consider how we complement the capabilities of our allies and push them also to lead, as I hope President Biden will do this week at the G7 summit in London. And I appreciate the efforts so far by the administration to make progress in these areas, including President Biden's announcement of at least 80 million doses for our partners around the world, with 75% of vaccines to the international distribution program, COVAX. I also appreciate the focus on vaccinating our neighbors here in the Western Hemisphere, Canada, Mexico, Latin America, and the Caribbean, which are deeply interconnected, as we all know, with the United States. It's a strong start, but we're only in the beginning of the fight against COVID-19, and I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. I'll now turn it over to Ranking Member Malia Tokas for her opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Castro, for calling this hearing today. I also want to thank Gail Smith and Jeremy, uh, Jeremy uh, Konendik for, again, taking the time to brief the committee. Uh, your roles in the work that you're doing at state and U.S. aid to combat the COVID-19 pandemic around the world is critically important. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has killed more than 3.7 million people worldwide, including more than 595,000 right here in America. Unfortunately, even though the U.S. is on a positive trajectory, the, the virus continues to devastate many countries around the world. The recent surge in India and Southeast Asia should be a wake-up call and reminder to all of us that we have a long road ahead. I was glad to see the administration announce that it is moving out, out in the first tranche of vaccine allocations. Our partners and allies urgently need this assistance, and we must be strategic in making these decisions. I'm very concerned by the Communist Ch Chinese uh, Party's efforts to, to exploit countries' economic and vaccination needs to secure political concessions. We are seeing this around the world, but especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. Some of Taiwan's allies have been asked to sever diplomatic ties with Taiwan in exchange for much needed vaccines. So far, none, of, none have agreed. But with Latin America and Caribbean home to nine of Taipei's, Taipei's uh, remaining 15 allies, we can expect this trend to continue. I look forward to hearing how the Biden administration is addressing these challenges, as well as ensuring Taiwan itself has access to vaccines. So far, the United States has provided over 15 billion in supplemental funding to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. We must fight this virus global, globally or else emerging variants will threaten hard fought progress. We also must prioritize resources to address the secondary impacts of COVID, especially on food security, supply chains, and backsliding in the fight against other infectious diseases. This pandemic marks, marks the first increase in global extreme poverty since the 1990s. As a subcommittee overseeing international development policy and international organizations, we have an important role in overseeing the administration's strategy to support recovery efforts. As I highlighted in the last hearing, it is critically important that every aid dollar is monitored and evaluated to ensure that the resources are used effectively and achieving desired outcomes. As malign actors seek to exploit this pandemic and undermine U.S. leadership, the Biden administration must deploy a comprehensive and aggressive vaccine diplomacy strategy to help partners in need and to advance U.S. strategic interests. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on how the administration plans to utilize the funds provided through the American Rescue Plan and how they plan to leverage these generous contributions to ensure other partners step up and do their part. At a time when many countries are facing domestic financial hardship, burden, burden sharing among our allies is critical. In closing, I would be remiss if I failed to mention the importance of working with our world partners in determining the, the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. The only way we will succeed in preventing future pandemics is if we learn the facts on its origin and what negligent actions, if any, were taken to prevent proper early containment. And I hope this will be a top focus and item on the agenda at the G7 this weekend. 
Again, I want to thank our witnesses here today and look forward to your testimony. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Meliotakis. Uh, and I'll now introduce our distinguished witnesses uh, we that we have with us today. The first is the Honorable Gail E. Smith, the Coordinator for Global COVID Response and Health Security at the Department of State. Ms. Smith also previously served as the 17th Administrator for USAID and as President and CEO of the ONE Campaign. We're also joined today by Mr. Jeremy Conendike, the Executive Director for the COVID-19 Task Force at USAID. I wanna thank each of you for stepping up and for serving when called and for being with us today to discuss these issues and to speak to what the administration is doing to lead internationally in the fight against COVID-19 and its effects around the world. I'll now recognize each witness for five minutes and without objection, your prepared written statements will be made part of the record. And I'll first call on Ms. Smith for her testimony. Ms. Smith, you have five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Castro and Ranking Member Maliotakis, and also to members of the subcommittee. We're grateful for your calling this hearing, and we're extremely grateful for the financial and other support that you've provided to this response. If I can set the stage, uh, I got my start in my career almost 40 years ago in the middle of an Ethiopian famine, ironically in Tigray and in Eritrea, in the middle of a war. And since that time, I have led, coordinated, or been in the field on more than 40 emergency operations, uh, including working with Jeremy on the Ebola epidemic. Never have I seen a crisis of these proportions or of this scale or one that demanded U.S. leadership more than this one does. Given the urgency, and both of you have pointed to the particulars of that, we're focused on two immediate imperatives. First is on vaccines, where obviously the need is urgent around the world and has been made more pressing by the fact that given conditions in India, the Serum Institute, which was relied upon heavily in the early planning for vaccine response, is not exporting vaccines. We've been working to increase the volume and availability of vaccines with production by local producers, increase local manufacture, including through our development finance corporation in countries so that more vaccines can be brought online as quickly as possible, and embarked on vaccine sharing with the announcement by the president of 80 million doses and very, very hard work with our allies to ensure that other countries increase their dose sharing. As well, we've been focused, and Jeremy will say more about this, on vaccine readiness to make sure that the healthcare workers and the healthcare systems are ready and able to deploy the vaccines as they become available. But we've got three responses going on, if you think about it. The first, urgent on vaccines and a humanitarian response. The second, to what might be called the shadow pandemics, and you've pointed to some of these. We've seen an impact on health, on HIV and AIDS, for example, there have been challenges in testing. I'm glad to report that PEPFAR has adapted its programming to ensure continuity of care and to overcome the challenges that come from, for example, temporary lockdowns with people getting their treatment. Rising food insecurity is a problem and is going to get worse with an anticipated increase in commodity prices. We've seen job losses in the poorest countries where entire sectors have collapsed. And at the macro level, many countries are facing debt distress, liquidity challenges, and potential insolvency. For these reasons, the work that USAID is doing, and I'm very proud to have been the 17th administrator of that agency, not only in the immediate response, but to bolster through the ARP money and its existing development budget is absolutely critical. <clears throat> also important on that front is the work of our Treasury Department where the secretary has taken a lead on the issuance of a new round of special drawing rights, which will ease some of the economic pressure and prevent many countries from facing the risk of collapse. The third level of response is on global health security. This is urgent, it's the long game. This is where we have to build the foundation so that we do not repeat what we've seen over the last 16 months. We're working on four fronts on this. The first is on reforming existing institutions, but also modernizing them. Because our challenge is not just, for example, WHO reform, but ensuring that WHO is fit for purpose for the challenges we know we're gonna see in the future. 
The second is on norms. Many countries, as you know, have signed on to the international health regulations. Too many of them have failed to adhere to the specifics and undertake the steps obligated. Third is on capacity building. We learned after Ebola that there was a willingness of countries to generate resources, including through the global health security agenda in which the United States had a prominent lead to build the capacity of countries to prevent, detect, and respond. The challenge was that funding was not sustained. So our challenge now, and we are working actively as the State Department in tandem with other countries to determine how we can finance this for the long term. Any hole in the net, any country that doesn't have that capacity provides an opening for viruses like COVID-19. Our challenge is to find sustainable funding and a sustained political commitment. Fourth is the key area of governance, transparency, and accountability. We must have transparency if we're to understand this or any other virus. We must have accountability. If governments sign on to rules and norms, then they must follow on. And we need forms of governance that will allow us to coordinate and collaborate when these crises occur. Again, this is a long game. It requires urgency, but also staying power. And we're gonna need the support of Congress to do this work over time. All of these things and getting to the title of this hearing require US leadership. And US leadership I've seen mean a number of things. It means that in a humanitarian crisis, in an emergency, we are most often the first and fastest to arrive. And I've seen throughout my career that countries and communities remember this and count on us for this. Second, it means that we build coalitions and we leverage. We have been very actively engaging our partners around the world in advance of the G7, but also, for example, to mobilize resources for COVAX. The Secretary of State launched an effort two months ago to mobilize $2 billion for Gavi for COVAX. And I'm pleased to report that we surpassed that goal, mobilizing $2.4 billion. We will continue to do that. But it also means that the U.S. provides assistance, and in this case, vaccines, not to influence, not to twist anybody's arm, and not as a means of political pressure, but as the means and the tool for ending this pandemic. U.S. leadership will also require the sustained support of Congress. As we've seen in the case of HIV and AIDS, where over almost 20 years, America has stood fast across Congress's and administrations to bring that epidemic to an end. And there are literally millions of people around the world who are alive today because of it. Lastly, the support of the American people, who I believe know that America's leadership in the world matters, but who also know that this is a matter of their own health and security. To work on all of these fronts, we've developed a five-part plan, which is now under implementation. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to let my colleague walk through the specifics of that. We're happy to take sure. any questions. No, well, thank you, Ms. Smith. I appreciate that. And thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on uh, Mr. Conendike for his testimony. Mr. Conendike, you have five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Castro and Ranking Member Maliotakis and all the members of the subcommittee for your attention to this crucial issue and your, your consistent support to uh, USAID and the State Department and the administration's response to the international aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to uh, particularly thank Congress for the generosity shown in, uh, in, in passing the American Rescue Plan, which has enabled USAID to uh, to to uh, reinforce the work we're doing globally, building on uh, the work that the the government began last year to fight the global uh, to fight the global pandemic, and I would underscore what uh, my colleague Gail said about the complexity and difficulty that this crisis um, uh, this crisis is demonstrating. In in my career. In, in and out of public service, I have led uh, government responses to international disasters like the West Africa Ebola outbreak. I have led humanitarian responses in the field. Um, I have worked on development programs. I have never seen anything quite like what we are witnessing with this pandemic today. It is it is a a triple crisis. It is a a obviously a health crisis, but it is a health crisis that is spurring a humanitarian crisis and that is spurring a development crisis and an economic crisis. And each of those three crises 
on their own would be historic in their own right. The three of them together uh, pose a challenge and uh, a call for American leadership that is, I think, unprecedented in our in our generation. And so fighting this is going to take an enormous and concerted effort. And so I will walk through uh, the, the five elements of the response plan that the administration has put together. Um, as, as Gail said, the first element of this is fighting the virus itself. And so we will do that through two major objectives. The first is around scaling and accelerating access to safe and effective vaccines. Um, the administration, as you have now seen, is beginning dose sharing. Um, uh, with an initial 80 million uh, doses that the, the president has announced will be shared with countries around the world, but prioritizing uh, countries in Asia, uh, in Asia and Africa and the Americas, uh, as you, you said, Chairman Castro, particularly providing support to our, our neighbors in the region. We are also making investments in scaling up vaccine production capacity. So the Development Finance Corporation has announced a collaboration um, with a producer in India that will scale up vaccine production further there for global markets and is also pursuing additional deals uh, in Africa, as they've announced um, uh, just a week or two ago, uh, in collaboration with other development finance partners from around the world. Um, we are also investing in country readiness to distribute vaccines, and this is a really crucial part of what we will be doing with some of our forthcoming programming because it's you know, ultimately someone is not made safe by a vaccine dose in a bottle, they're made safe by a dose in an arm. So we need to be looking at everything from the supply chain on the front end to the administration that gets that dose into that arm. We also recognize that vaccines are, uh, are, are, are uh, going to take a while to scale up globally, and we're going to push very hard to uh, to get to global vaccine access next year. But in the meantime, as we're seeing in South Asia, this virus can do a lot of damage, especially as we see increasingly dangerous variants emerging and, and, and evolving. And so we are, our second objective is to continue pushing hard and to really double down on the immediate support to health systems and public health interventions that are gonna save lives in the months ahead. And this is through things like uh, protecting health workers through provision of PPE, provision of, uh, of, of testing and diagnostic support, um, enhancing access to medical oxygen, which is the most crucial life-saving intervention. Uh, so a range of things like that that will save lives um, in the immediate term while we are simultaneously pushing hard on vaccines um, that will begin coming online at scale later this year and into, the, into next year. Uh, we are simultaneously focusing on, on what Gail uh, called the shadow pandemic, which is an, a nice way to put it. It is all of the other forms of human impact, uh, the sort of secondary effects that are for many people the primary effects that they feel. And that's things like disruptions to education. At the high point last year, 90% of learners around the world were having their education disrupted in some way. It's massive humanitarian impacts, a 40% increase in humanitarian need, uh, enormous impacts, risk of famine in multiple countries. Um, and, and household scale economic disruptions. Uh, and as the, the ranking member said, the first increase in extreme poverty in, uh, in about 25 years. Uh, we're also at the same time focused on systemic risks. We have seen, uh, as I think you said, Chairman, uh, risks to uh, closure of civil society space, um, uh, using public health measures as cover for closing democratic uh, activities. And, um, and so we are focused on that as well. And the fifth is to build, the fifth objective of our plan is to build back the future architecture we need through uh, reforms to international institutions and building different norms and, and, and procedures and tools for keeping the world safe from the next pandemic. Uh, I see I'm at time. I will stop there, but happy to say much more on all of those in the uh, in the question period. Thank you. Oh, thank you for your testimony. And as you mentioned, we'll have a chance to get into a back and forth here in the Q&A. But uh, I'll now recognize members for five minutes each. And pursuant to House rules, all time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses. Uh, because of the virtual format of this hearing, I'll recognize members by committee seniority, alternating between majority and the minority. And I can only call on you if you're present with your video on. Uh, if you miss your turn, please let our staff know and we'll circle back to you. If you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally. Uh, and before I recognize myself for questions, I'll just remind everyone, if you go to the layout function at the top, near the top right of your screen and go to grid view, you can follow the clock, the timer on your five minutes. Um, otherwise you're gonna make me be rude and cut you off after five minutes. Uh, so please, everybody try to follow that timer 
so that we can get everybody's questions in here in a timely fashion. All right, I recognize myself now uh, for five minutes. The American Rescue Plan contained roughly $4 billion for USAID and $3.5 billion for the Global Fund uh, when you combine the different accounts. This funding is critical to address the secondary and tertiary impacts of the pandemic, which are, as y'all mentioned, extensive. Uh, given the urgency, I'm concerned that there are a few details on where and when this funding will go out the door. So I wanted to ask y'all, how will the ARP funding be prioritized to address the secondary effects of COVID-19, such as international disaster relief, food security, and health activities? And when do you expect it to get out, out into the field? And do you expect current funding and plans to fully reverse COVID's effects on poverty, nutrition, or education? And what's the full gap between where we are and where we need to be in the international response? Um, thank you so much for that, for that question, Chairman. It's, it's an incredibly important issue, and I'm glad you're focusing on the secondary impacts because those are so, uh, as I said, primary for, for so many people around the world. Uh, we are already beginning to uh, to address those impacts through use of the ARP funding. Uh, we have begun uh, programming support to our humanitarian response as the uh, that began heading out the door earlier this spring to address first and foremost, some of the acute food security impacts that we have been seeing around the world. So we uh, we used both the ESF in the ARP, as well as some of the Title II food aid commodities uh, appropriated through the ARP to, uh, to begin targeting critical gaps in food security pipelines that risked under, undermining food deliveries in, um, in critical places like Yemen, Ethiopia, um, uh, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. Uh, as we go forward, we are uh, we are now also on the cusp of initiating um, uh, uh, an extension and expansion of our work around vaccine readiness and around support to health systems um, and exploring in consultation with the State Department and the Treasury Department ways to address other non health impacts of the pandemic. Um, and uh, we're still determining exactly what, what, how we will divide resources within the administration on some of those secondary impacts. But um, you know, our internal planning is, uh, has identified uh, significant needs around uh, economic support at the household level, economic support at the macro level as well, um, and the role of, as Gail said, the Treasury Department and the multilateral um, financial institutions is quite important there and uh, education and food security. You know, food security is an issue, obviously, in humanitarian settings, but we've also seen pretty significant food security impacts outside of humanitarian settings um, tied to often those uh, acute economic impacts. So um, uh, in terms of your question on the gap, I would say two things. I think first, um, you know, there there is certainly more need in the world than any one government can carry alone. So our you know we will we will orient our resources towards this, but we are also urging others to to join us in addressing these gaps. Uh, but also the the degree to which there is a gap between resources and need is going to be a function of how long we let the pandemic run. So the most urgent priority, while we are also touching on the secondary gaps, is to shorten the length of the pandemic as much as possible so that its effects end and people can begin recovering. And I think the size of the gap ultimately will depend on how long the pandemic is allowed to run. Well, let me, and I want to ask one more question and make one more point. And I know that obviously we've committed a lot of money to buying vaccines. There's some reports that y'all may not be able to confirm yet about another big purchase of Pfizer vaccines uh, to provide to the world. Uh, but as you know, it's not just about the vaccines themselves. It's also about getting those vaccines into arms. And I think it's the Democratic Republic of Congo is already returning 1.3 million doses from COVAX because it can't administer them before they expire. So how do we make sure that we have the infrastructure set up to actually get those vaccines into arms? Because otherwise they're just gonna spoil, right? Yeah, I think it's it's two things. We need to make sure that we are calibrating the deliveries to what countries are, are ready to move. And it's been positive, I think, 
in a way, DRC is a success story in that um, those vaccines were identified as being surplus to what they could do and were returned so they could still be used elsewhere. Um, that is, is critically important. But obviously, there are major gaps. And I think we've heard this from UNICEF. I, I was on a call just earlier today with the leaders of the AU Vaccine Initiative who also identified, yes, please help us to get vaccines, but we also need your help with delivery. So that's going to be a, a priority focus for our, our next rounds of investments in the, in the health response. Thank you all. Uh, I'm going to keep myself on time. And we have with us the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mike McCall of Texas. And so I'm going to go to him next for his questions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Castro and ranking member Ali Hitakis uh, for allowing me to be your subcommittee here today. I want to first thank uh, Gail and Jeremy for taking the time to discuss ongoing COVID-19 response efforts at the State Department and USAID. Uh, Gail, on a personal note and professionally, it's great to work with you uh, at the One Campaign, and I'm glad to see you in this new role uh, that you have. Um, and while the situation has improved here in the United States on COVID, uh, the pandemic rages on in developing countries. Uh, the economic, political, and physical impacts of the virus are putting countries and regions that were already fragile at risk of further destabilization. I'm also deeply concerned that the, Ch the Chinese Communist Party whose uh, cover-up obstructed early response efforts is seeking to leverage this pandemic to project influence and extract political concessions. In Paraguay, for example, I understand the CCP is demanding Paraguay drop its diplomatic recognition of Taiwan in exchange for doses of Sinovac. The Kremlin is also to blame as disinformation campaigns seek to undermine public confidence in U.S. manufactured vaccines. Robust U.S. engagement is urgently needed to push back on these malign efforts and support our partners and allies in their time of need. As a foreign affairs committee, um, as this committee has always uh, uh, had an important responsibility to conduct oversight over, over the $10 billion provided to the State Department and USAID as part of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we owe it to the American taxpayer and to the millions of people around the world in, in desperate need of life-saving aid to ensure every dollar is being used effectively, clearly branded, and advancing U.S. strategic interests. The devastating COVID-19 surge in India and Southeast Asia forecast the potential consequences elsewhere in the world if we do not urgently scale up the vaccine production and distribution. Uh, last week, I, I noted, uh, as was noted earlier, the White House announced plans to allocate 25 million vaccine doses. Moments ago, we saw reports that the White House will buy 500 million doses of Pfizer vaccines to donate around the world. Um, so my, uh, beginning my question is, is to, um, to Gail, can you describe the interagency process taking place to determine which countries are receiving vaccines and what criteria is being used and to the panel as a whole? Uh, secondly, I wanna draw your attention um, to exciting news from both my home state of Texas and Chairman Castro uh, through a partnership with Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine and Biological E Limited, that their vaccine Corvivax has just reached phase three clinical trials in India. And if all goes well, well, they could reach final approval by the fall. India has just finalized an advanced purchase order of 300 million doses of this vaccine. This is a tremendous achievement, and I want to commend uh, both Dr. Hotez and Dr. Batazi uh, and their team for their work. Um, so if you could perhaps comment on, on that uh, effort, as well as the interagency and criteria for the vaccines. Sure. Um, thank you, and thank you for your kind words, and congratulations for that news out of Texas. We saw the news about the phase three trials, and I think What's really critical here is it underscores, again, the contribution uh, of American ingenuity. Uh, the more vaccines that are ultimately available, the better it will be. And I will share with you that it's been both my and Jeremy's experience that despite, despite the moves of China or Russia to use misinformation and disinformation to undermine uh, views of these and other vaccines, it's been our experience that the demand is overwhelmingly uh, for vaccines in which people have confidence for both safety and efficacy. On the allocation of the 25 million vaccines, which is the first tranche of 80 million, 
Um, it's been a robust and very engaged interagency response. The State Department, uh, the NSC, USAID, HHS, CDC, all have been engaged. And the criterion there uh, were mainly three. First, this is a start. And our aim here is to end this pandemic as quickly as possible. So we wanted to get global coverage uh, and as such had a big focus on Latin America, uh, <clears throat> Asia, and Africa. The second was to take a look at countries that were nearing a surge and a surge at risk of surge and where we could argue, even though the urgency is, is dominant pretty much everywhere, that there was perhaps greater urgency. Uh, and the third was a desire to be responsive to the many requests we've had, including from our neighbors. So it was on that basis that we made the decision for the allocation of the first 25 million. But I would underscore this is just the beginning. Uh, Jeremy. Uh, and and on the um, on the, the the vaccine from um, from Texas Children's Hospital, uh, we, we are looking forward to seeing the results of the phase three trial. But it's certainly an encouraging uh, encouraging data out of the, the the phase one phase two trials, and we welcome and and are really happy to see any additional tools that come into the toolkit on the vaccine front. Um, the more the more effective vaccines, especially those that are low cost and uh, have easier logistics, um, the, I think the better for the goal of vaccinating the world as quickly as possible. So we're encouraged. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member McCall. We'll no, now go to our uh, vice chair of our subcommittee, Sarah Jacobs of San Diego. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Gail and Jeremy. It's great to see you both. Thank you for being here. Um, I was very glad to hear reports of the 500 million uh, doses of Pfizer that will be provided. Um, and I think it's a very important step. I hope the reports are true, um, but they still fall short of the 11 billion doses needed to vaccinate the entire world. And it's gonna take a long time, uh, enough time for different potentially more dangerous variants to spread. Um, so to address this in the quickest way possible, we're going to need to turn our attention to uh, significantly ramping up manufacturing capacity. And I appreciate the administration's support of a TRIPS waiver at the WTO, but we've yet to reach consensus at the WTO. And there are also questions surrounding how to galvanize cooperation from manufacturers on providing know-how to outside patents. So um, Ms. Smith and Mr. Uh, Conande, could you describe the administration's plans to address this manufacturing issue worldwide beyond the TRIPS waiver? Sure. Let me uh, say a couple things and then, Jeremy, I'll turn it over to you. Um, you're absolutely right that increasing the supply, the volume, and the speed with which vaccines are delivered is key. So we are working with producers to increase their production and their production for this year and to ramp that up. Second, this issue of local manufacture, which uh, Jeremy and I both mentioned through our Development Finance Corporation, is key. In the India initiative, we believe that doses will be brought online uh, by the end of the year. And DFC is looking at other options where, again, we could bring doses online before the end of the year and into the first and second quarters of 2022. The third and fourth things, one is mobilizing more resources for COVAX, which as I said, we've been able to do by using our generous contribution to leverage more support from others. And we're very pleased that the initiative the secretary kicked off surpassed its goal. The last is to use our leverage. And as you know, the G7 summit is coming up. We have been engaged with G7 and other members who also have development finance institutions and have the ability both to share more themselves, which we are urging uh, all members of the G7 and others to do, but also to increase their investment so that we can ramp up production all over the world. So we're working on all of those fronts to get as much supply out there as we can as quickly as possible. Yeah, what I'd, I'd add to that is as we think about, um, as we think about how do we get as many shots in arms as possible by next year, we really think about this as sort of four four pieces. So the first piece is outlining what is the strategy, what are the doses that can get us there, and what how do we best combine the different attributes of some of the different the different vaccines that are available, um, taking into account how scalable they are, some of the production bottlenecks, and and so on in order to in order to get there. Um, so to have a a, a strategy for for uh, reaching global coverage. 
the second then is ensuring that we have the manufacturing capacity globally in order to do that. And I think what we're what we're seeing now is that the, the biggest bottleneck at the moment is not actually the, the, the production capacity, it is the inputs to feed that production capacity. And uh, and so one of the, the the things we did back in April when we were announcing support for India as they were experiencing their surge there was reroute some production input supplies that had been used for AstraZeneca here in the US to India to produce AstraZeneca there to amplify their production. And, um, and so we are looking at strategies both for expanding the available uh, supply of inputs, but also for trying to optimize those uh, across different doses to make sure we're getting the best yields that we can from the, from the supplies that exist. The third element is financing all of this. And so, um, uh, the U.S. support to COVAX and um, uh, the uh, the fundraising that we have been helping COVAX to do, as Gail said, another two point four billion dollars was just raised yeah. in the last few weeks. I just uh, want to cut you off quickly yeah, so sorry, I can make sure please. I get to my second question. But no, the financing is is really important, and I I appreciate you going over it. Um, we know that this is not going to be the last pandemic, um, that uh, this, in fact, is something we're probably going to see uh, recur more often. Um, an article in Nature Ma uh, Medicine recently proposed an intergovernmental panel on pandemic risk at the UN to tackle some of this question uh, in a systemic way. Uh, I was wondering if the administration has looked into this idea. Is it planning on pushing for that or what? Uh, we're doing to support and undertake systematic risk assessments of the pandemic so that we're better prepared in the future. Um, great question. We have only a few seconds. There's some very good recommendations like that that we are looking at because clearly we meet we need much better uh, mechanisms and tools for collective action, whether it's on surveillance all the way through to response. So we're looking at all those recommendations. Great, thank you. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, we now go to our ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, ranking member Malia Takis. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, ranking member McCall uh, took my question about the vaccine distribution. So I'm going to shift uh, to talk a little bit about the supply chain. I was wondering if our speakers could give us any insight into what are some of the existing challenges right now with regard to you know, the global supply chain in general. I did see yesterday that uh, a cluster of infections at a factory in Taiwan temporarily shut down uh, operations at one of the world's largest chip testing companies. And uh, you know, this is something that I think concerns all of us. And I just wanted to see what was the latest information you had on, on some of the examples of how we're being affected both domestically and the international global community is also being affected by some of these disruptions due to COVID and if that is playing into your decision-making regarding the vaccine distribution. Yeah, um, let me say a couple things and thank you for the question. We're seeing disruptions like this and have since the onset of the pandemic all over the world in all sectors of the economy. And it's one of the reasons that even as we do everything on the response, we are uh, with our partners strongly urging that they take the steps necessary and the hard and difficult steps as we all know uh, to protect people so we see fewer disruptions. Um, I think those disruptions do, in fact, occasionally disrupt the supply for vaccines. Again, the, the most dramatic example being in the case of India, where a breathtaking surge uh, has meant that doses that had been anticipated from the Serum Institute <clears throat> are now going to India. So those kinds of disruptions are something that we can't necessarily plan for, but we need to assume are going to be part of what the world looks like over the next 18 months at least. That's why, again, the emphasis on increasing supply in every possible way we can. Jeremy, yeah, not, like not, not so ahead. much. The, I wasn't necessarily talking about the impact on the, the, the supply of vaccine, but just uh, the supply chain in general. Um, and right. okay. like, are there particular countries that you're seeing that, you know, we're, we're, the costs of a lot of, uh, you know, for example, lumber has gone up tremendously, and now this, this, some of the 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 tech, technology uh, parts in Taiwan, you're seeing. I, I just it was more general question, not related just to specific yes. to vaccines. No, no, and if I, yes, and the, well, the answer to that is an absolute yes. We are seeing pressure on supply chains all over the world, and the main thing I would say on that is that that lends itself to the urgency of bringing this pandemic to a close as quickly as we can and moving as many vaccines as we can while pressing others to do it. Because only when we can shut down the space in which the virus can flourish and can replicate and mutate, can we protect the supply chains. 
So and we're for your vaccine countries where that's a critical issue, but it's frankly a critical Got issue it. all over the world at this point. Okay, and that, that's a good answer. Thank you. And uh, Jeremy, if you'd like to add anything. Yeah, I, I would really point to what we've seen in India uh, over the past few months. You know, we we have been consulting regularly with with uh, U.S. businesses. Um, uh, my boss, Samantha Power, met recently with uh, CEOs of 25 major corporations organized by the U.S. Chamber. We've been talking regularly with colleagues at the Chamber. One of the things that they've really been underscoring is how much so many American businesses rely on India for so much of their, particularly their back office functions, but their supply chain functions, their IT. Um, and so they were seeing disruption to their U.S. business processes based on what was mm. happening in India. And I think it just gets to the interconnectedness that you're talking about and the importance of under, you know, it, it, targeting this as a global problem, not a problem that any one country can uh, seal itself off from. So I'm glad you're underscoring that point. I think it's, it's very resonant with what we've been seeing and hearing from U.S. businesses. Yeah, I, I would continue to just uh, reinforce the need to you know, make sure that those countries where we're seeing a particular disruption in our supply chain are, are looked at as a priority to make sure that we can get our economy back on track and also help uh, other countries mm -hmm. as well. And I appreciate uh, both your answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, ranking member. And we'll go now to uh, Congressman Sherman of Los Angeles, California. Thank you. This disease is the greatest catastrophe to hit the globe since uh, the 1940s. We've already counted 3 million deaths. That for the world is just the beginning. And that doesn't count those whose health has been permanently injured, those whose education uh, has been permanently derailed, and the enormous economic consequences. And for poor countries, economic disruption can lead uh, to deaths as well. Um, the world is focused uh, on the cause of this uh, outbreak. There are five possible ways to look at it. Either it had nothing to do with the Wuhan virology lab, or that lab was dealing with bad viruses, uh, did not modify virus in any way, but it just happened to escape from the lab. Um, and of course, we have the 2018 report of the State Department saying that that lab was dealing with bat viruses and was sloppy about it. The third possibility is that the lab actually modified, perhaps gain of function research, the virus, um, and then it escaped. The fourth is that the lab was working on a bioweapon and then through negligence it escaped. And the fifth possibility, uh, and the only possibility that I dismiss out of hand, is that uh, the virus was modified and then deliberately released on the world. The last administration first accepted everything President Xi said, then attacked the WHO for accepting what President Xi said. The difference here is the WHO has no intel function at all. It can't see through any Communist Party uh, uh, of China lies. In contrast, we in the Congress provide well over $80 billion for an intel community. Uh, the, uh, and therefore, it is the U.S. government, not the WHO, that can finally, hopefully, tell us, and it's much more difficult now that it's a year, a, a year and a half later, uh, exactly what the source was. At least it's only our intel community that can see through uh, obstacles imposed by uh, the Chinese government. Um, Ms. Jacobs is right that this is not the last uh, pandemic of our lifetimes. Um, the, uh, there's a tendency to, uh, well, in, we've got to make sure that we keep the vaccine manufacturers, uh, uh, treat them uh, as they expect it to be treated. Uh, I know that uh, you can just say, hey, the Pfizer's making a lot of money, but uh, there are many manufacturing uh, uh, manufacturers whose vaccines failed and uh, they took that risk. And there's probably going to be litigation as a result of this vaccine. There are always is. And uh, so the chance to lose money solving the next pandemic is certainly there. So as we change the rules as we may need to, to facilitate the fastest possible manufacture of additional vaccine, uh, hopefully um, we uh, uh, will not do so in a way 
that causes vaccine members not to be on board next time we need them. Um, we, uh, our witnesses have already covered uh, the importance of uh, manufacturing new vaccine as quickly as possible. One other thing, though, is to avoid wastage of vaccine. It was back in December uh, that I focused on the fact that they were throwing away each bottle of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine after five dosages, of, particularly Pfizer, uh, even though there were six and a half to seven dosages in the bottle. Uh, they cured that. But the other issue is whether we're injecting, I mean, this vaccine's more valuable than liquid gold, uh, twice as much as we need to. Uh, there is substantial medical research that says that the dosage being given, particularly those between 18 and uh, 55, is twice as many drops as needed. Uh, and I've talked to Dr. Fauci about this. The attitude seemed to be, well, this won't affect America because we're already through the back. We he anticipated we'd already be have enough vaccine by May, and he was right. Um, but it certainly affects the world. Um, so I'll ask our witnesses, are you aware of any research being done to determine whether we're in effect wasting half of every uh, half the vaccine uh, uh, and to determine whether it would be safe and effective? Um, let me quickly comment, if I may, and thank you for the, the question. There is ongoing research and has been for some time now on all of these vaccines, on safety, efficacy, dosage, storage. And what we are doing is closely following all of that research so that we can adapt as and when we've got definitive data that shows that we can be safe and efficacious but make modifications. So there's a constant watch on all of that research. All right, the gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Congressman Daryl Issa of California. Thank you. And uh, uh, I appreciate uh, Congressman Sherman's uh, question because I, I think those are the kinds of things that are really going to allow us to do more for the world quicker. Uh, and uh, so hopefully that's something in which what he's heard, we can close the loop on uh, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, following up though, uh, when we look at the priorities, there was an earlier question, uh, which I'd asked uh, Secretary of State uh, earlier, but I'm, I wanna go through this again. China has used vaccine as a weapon uh, of, the, of diplomacy to be kind. Uh, as a result, countries who recognize Taiwan, for example, are finding themselves without vaccine. Uh, what can we and, and how should we ensure that, those, that we effectively put our thumb on the scale of justice uh, as great or greater for those who resist? Um, let me start and then I'll turn it over to my colleague and thank you for the question. Uh, I think we've been very clear and the president's been very clear that our intention is again, not to use vaccines as, as you suggest uh, in the case of China, as a weapon or as a tool for pressure, but as the tool for ending the pandemic. And I think that in sharp contrast to some other countries, countries recognize that the United States is doing this to end the pandemic. That very quickly puts us in contrast uh, to others. And I think in a way that makes a significant difference. Uh, at the same time, we are making sure, as I said at the top, in terms of how we allocate these vaccines to ensure global coverage so that we can get as much reach as possible. No, I, I appreciate um, that. Mine was a more, Gail, mine was a more new, nuanced question. Yeah. Uh, it was simply, are we in a position, do we have or can we have a policy that recognizes the deficit made by not being able to buy, let's say from China, uh, and offsetting it. Uh, it. Certainly, you would recognize that if a country got product from China, they might need less in initially, but it's the offset, it's the specific <clears throat> of, can we treat them equally when one has been denied? Uh, I, I mean, Congressman, what I might say to that is, I think what gives China leverage right now, or has given China leverage up to now, has been scarcity. So the more that we can address the scarcity problem, which we are which we are now trying to do by beginning U.S. dose sharing and with the president's announcement, um, 
the other week, we are now, you know, we will be the largest uh, share of donated doses in the world by a large margin, and we will continue to build on that um, by our support to COVAX and the, the funding that we have put in and will continue uh, continue um, additionally putting in. That will expand the, the volumes of doses that do not depend at all on China. And the more that a country can turn to the U.S. or to COVAX or to others, um, the less than that China has the leverage to extract concessions with its doses. And I think that that will actually our, our work to flood the zone with more vaccines puts pressure on China to um, or and, and reduces their space to extract those kind of political concessions. One follow up question, uh, and, and this is, you know, we, we 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 by definition, we don't want to be heavy handed when we make gifts. Uh, on the other hand, a, a dose in the arm of of someone who drives a truck from town to town in a developing country is more valuable than a dose of somebody who never moves around. And a dose, two doses in some cases, into the arms of somebody who's going to travel internationally uh, is more valuable than somebody, again, who stays in a single town. Uh, what are we doing to, uh, to facilitate those kinds of decisions that move forward those decisions in addition to healthcare workers and the others that uh, would ordinarily be first to receive first responders and the like. So there's a really active um, research process and, and uh, kind of strategy deliberation going on right now uh, within our government, between our government and World Health Organization and other researchers around exactly this question around dosing strategy. And I, I referenced this a bit in my response to, uh, I think it was uh, Representative Jacobs as well, that um, that's exactly the right kind of question, Congressman. So I, I think the way we would think about this is, is similar to what we've done in our own country. You start with healthcare workers because they face the highest risks and they take the highest risks. Then you shift to the populations at highest risk of very severe outcomes, starting with the elderly and those with comorbidities. That relieves burden on the healthcare system. And then you shift to try and um, vaccinate and to block transmission at scale. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Congressman Issa. We're going to go next to Congresswoman uh, Houlihan of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for coming. I actually had a very similar conversation this morning on the HASC side of things with the DOD and the Pentagon and how they're managing their their version of this. And so I um, I had a prepared question, but I wanted to follow up with uh, Mr. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Conendike, about the last conversation about um, our ability to ask or mandate how um, countries that were contributing vaccines to um, are allocating them. And the understanding I had from that last conversation this morning was we don't and we can't. Um, is there anything that we can be doing to be more prescriptive and, and, and therefore be more effective with the limited dosing that we do have? Sure. So, um, Every country that participates in the COVAX platform, which is which is nearly every uh, low and middle income country in the world, had to prepare and submit for review by um, for technical review by uh, COVAX and the WHO, what's called a national deployment and vaccination plan, which lays out how the country will prioritize all the sorts of things that um, Congressman Issa was just asking about. What is the sequencing? How will the country prioritize? What systems have they put in place? What quality, quality assurance do they have? And so I, I, I wouldn't say there's nothing in place. I, I'd say those, you know, those plans vary in quality depending on the strength of the government, as you might imagine. Um, a, country like, uh, a country like India uh, is going to have a stronger plan than, than a country with a weaker health system might, for example. But, um, but those plans do give us insight and, um, and create some accountability for how those vaccines will be used and create a benchmark against which the distribution can be assessed. We are also providing through USAID uh, a significant amount of technical assistance and we're going to be expanding that in the, uh, in the months ahead um, uh, as, we, as we expand our programming in this area that supports governments in that targeting and enables them to, um, to, to have the kind of logistics and distribution architecture that they need to distribute responsibly also does monitor supports things like monitoring for adverse events um, uh, so that um, so that that, and that so kind of reporting like is, organizations, is being yes programs like pepfar uh, are are part of this coordinated response that you're absolutely leveraging. absolutely and pepfar okay. is a great platform for a lot of what we will be doing on this front um, in many in much of africa in particular 
Thank you. And my uh, my other questions were for uh, Ms. Smith um, and had to do with the disproportionate impact that COVID is having on women and, and girls and, and their economic security. Uh, women are not, in, not in, just in this country, but in all countries, not going to be able to return to work uh, and, and largely are, you know, children, child care responsibilities, school closures and those sorts of things. Uh, how can we in the U.S. be more attentive to leveraging our investments internationally and globally to respond to this, uh, these threats and trends globally? It's, it's a really good question and thank you for, for asking it. I think we've seen across the board, whether it's in PEPFAR, a lot of USAID programming, other programs where we've had a disproportionate number of girls have to leave school. Uh, we've seen women facing uh, obstacles in the workforce, including on the childcare front, as well as a dramatic uptick in domestic gender-based violence. All of those things are being factored into both our humanitarian response and what Jeremy described as the secondary response so that we can start helping countries to recover from some of those gains. Now, to be fair, I think women are going to feel the undue burden of this for longer than men because some of these impacts are structural. But particularly as we assist countries to try to bring uh, education back online. There are ways through our programming we can emphasize, emphasize getting girls back in school. Uh, as we are looking at the collapse of small medium enterprises and how to bring jobs back online, similarly, it's by taking a particular focus on the gender dimensions and the impact on women and girls at the front end that our programming can be designed to account for that. And I, I, I thank you. And I don't know how much time I have left, but that really leads into my next question, which does have to do with educational program and distance learning and all of those kinds of things. How can we adapt our assistance programs or what have we learned, frankly, from this time that we're experiencing collectively to make sure that we can expand access to the internet and technology globally through our foreign assistance programs? Or is that something that you know you guys are thinking about? That's absolutely something we're thinking. Yeah, absolutely something we're thinking about and have been working on. Um, so in our uh, in our work on education, uh, we've provided about nine hundred million dollars worth of of, of of education programming uh, that has touched on COVID in some way, both through new funding and by uh, funding that we have pivoted and adapted from existing education programs. And one of the big things that we've been investing in, exactly as you're saying, is support to remote and distance learning um, where that's an option, so that um, that school people children who've had their education disrupted have had recourse to, to that where that's technically feasible. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll now go to uh, Representative Kim of New Jersey. Great, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Smith, uh, Mr. Conondike, so great to see the two of you, and I, I can't tell you. I think that uh, Representative Kim may be having some uh, connectivity issues. Let's see if we give him a few seconds to get back on. All right, y'all, why don't we, um, while we wait for uh, for Andy to, to get his connection in a little bit better shape, uh, why don't we take uh, second round questions now? Because I think that completes the first round of questions. Again, for the members, don't feel compelled to ask a question on a second round. It's just the opportunity in case there was something that you were dying to ask uh, that you didn't have a chance to. Um, this will be an opportunity. And so uh, I'll begin with a question here. And then uh, if you've got a question, members, please have your staff or reach out directly to our committee staff so that they can let me know who's in the queue on second round questions, okay? All right. I wanted to ask you all uh, about the U.S.-Mexico border communities. Uh, the Biden administration recently announced that they'll share about a million COVID-19 vaccines with Mexico, and many of these doses will go to communities along the U.S.-Mexico border. In response to the Biden announcement, the Mexican government announced that much of those doses will go to Caribbean resort hotspots, such as Cancun and Los Cabos. Uh, while I agree that it's important to share doses with workers in this, these regions, I'm also concerned that border communities will be left out or not prioritized. Uh, how much input is the United States having on where we would like uh, vaccines donated to be used within a particular country? And how are you prioritizing certain communities 
like healthcare workers? And what's the United States doing to help the over 1 million American citizens who live in Mexico get access to these vaccines? So I think, uh, and, and uh, I will turn to Jeremy on this as well. I think on this issue of how a country uses vaccines, um, as Jeremy's described, that's based on their plans. I think that said, particularly with countries with which we've got a robust dialogue, we've certainly got the space to raise issues that may be of concern to us. Uh, I can look into that and follow up on the specifics of, of the reference to resorts. I was not familiar with that. Um, so I think that's, that's our main approach to that. Uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with the resorts issue, but in general, we are, um, you know, we are urging countries to prioritize healthcare workers first. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, but we are ultimately like, you know, a country controls its own vaccine distribution. Uh, I think that's something that the point you raised is certainly something that we can, uh, we can look into further and follow up with them on and get back. Sure. Here. Well, and, and my concern is either uh, the donor nations, uh, including the United States or COVAX or somebody, I think, has to set up some rules for the road. Uh, even if we turn, even if yeah. as we're doing, we turn it over to those countries and say, you know, distribute it, deliver it, uh, execute according to your own plans. Who's actually checking in or overseeing that and making sure yeah. that those yeah. nations are successful in what they're doing? Uh, now, bear in mind, as we turn it over to them, well, let me ask this, uh, before we turn it over to them, do they actually submit their plans to us so that we can review what their, you know, what their plan of operation is? So, so in the case of Mexico, no. Um, so they are in, in, within the COVAX consortium, they're what's called a self-financing country, which is basically, they're using COVAX as a procurement mechanism, but they're paying for their own vaccines within COVAX. So the, um, there the threshold is lower because it's not a donated, uh, it's not a donated material through COVAX. It's just something where they're buying it themselves using COVAX. Although as the mechanism. I thought we were, aren't we sending over We vaccines? are, but we are donating our vaccines. And uh, you know, there has been consultation through the embassies. I don't know how detailed it has been on the specific targeting intent for these vaccines, but I think we can check and follow up. Okay. Uh, and I, I would just reiterate, I, and I know that y'all are working hard and doing your very best and, and, you know, we're all working towards the same goal, but I would just impress upon you all that we've got to do everything possible to make sure that, especially the countries that are receiving donations uh, from around the world, that they're executing on their plans, that they're vaccinating people uh, in, in, you know, in a smart way, prioritizing people in a smart way. Uh, otherwise, my fear is that we'll be here a year from now or two years from now, three years from now, and there are going to be all these stories in the press about how this nation received 10 million doses uh, right. and, and only 2 million of yeah. them ever got used. Uh, that's yeah. my fear, unless there's some real oversight of what's going on. And I think, I, I think that's a very, very good point and something we're very focused on. On the case of Mexico, we'd like to get back to you, but I think in the sure. case of many countries uh, when it comes to COVAX, as Jeremy said, their plans have to be technically reviewed beforehand. We've got the uh, additional benefit of having a USAID presence in the presence of other partners in those countries, which gives us some assurance that we can track how those vaccines are being deployed. And quite frankly, in many cases, advice. Because in a lot of cases, they're looking to USAID or to UNICEF or others for advice. Uh, and sure. that's where we can weigh in significantly. And then my final we'll analogy would be on this. Uh, I just fear that it's going to be like, uh, you know, tax abatements for big companies that promise to create 5,000 jobs. And then, you know, five years down the road, you learn that they only created 500 jobs, right? And, and there was no, and then you can't claw back any of those funds. Uh, so anyway, my time is running out. Uh, thank you all very much. I see, I know that uh, Sarah's got a question, but it looks like Andy's back. So I want to see if Andy's technology is working uh, a little bit better. And so we'll go to him first. Uh, Andy Kim, representative from New Jersey. Yeah, Chairman, uh, hopefully this time is going to work a little better. But uh, You sound good. I, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to thank uh, uh, Ms. Smith and, and Mr. Conondike. Uh, uh, it's, it means so much to me to see you two uh, doing this work. It gives me great confidence in, in terms of uh, the expertise that you two bring to this. So um, just thank you so much for agreeing to, to take on this incredibly important mission. Uh, one thing I just wanted to hone in on, I know you've been asked about a whole lot of different things, but one thing that I, I saw in both of your testimonies was mentioned about the, develop, the Development Finance Corporation. 
And I, I guess I just wanted to drill into that just a little bit and, and get a sense of, of, of where else this can be kind of utilized or, or what, you, what you sort of see it fitting into. You know, Mr. Condite, you know, you kind of made reference to this in, in different ways. And, you know, I see this as potentially incredibly critical tool for us to be able to aid developing countries around the world. And, and it's something that's already being talked yeah. out about that kind of way. Um, can, can either of you speak to the role that the DFC can play and should play in sure. vaccine distribution and manufacturing abroad? Sure. Um, a couple of things at the top, and it's an absolute pleasure to see you and see you in your uh, current role, us having worked together in the past. Um, the DFC is a vital piece of this, and I think it's been strengthened, obviously, by the passage of the BUILD Act with strong bipartisan support around, uh, across Congress, because that's given it extra strength and additional tools. And as we both described, the DFC, in terms of making the investments that can take local manufacture from one level to the next level in terms of volume, is absolutely critical. Um, it, it has less direct impact on vaccine distribution than some other mechanisms but, for example, if we can increase local manufacture in different parts of the world, that aids global distribution significantly, right? Because you've got proximity and you've got more availability within regions. But the other point I would make about DFC, and I think in many cases, a, a lash up between DFC and USAID makes a big difference on this front, is that it can make investments in things that help us for the next pandemic, ideally preventing it but being prepared, which is if you look at global manufacture of other supplies that have been needed in this pandemic. DFC can make investments in those kinds of things or in the medicines and therapeutics that over time developing countries need to produce more of given their high dependence on imports. So it's a really, really vital, vital tool. And I think we're pleased across the administration that the BUILD Act has given it the additional uh, heft that it's now got. Yeah, no, that, that's great to hear, Ms. Smith. And I, I think that, uh, you know, this is something that I'm, I'm taking a very close look at. We'd love to be able to continue to talk to the two of you and others about where we can go, because I do think that there's a lot of opportunities to build yeah. on this, even beyond what we've done, and look at, you know, expanding some of the lending powers to be able to fight not only this current crisis, but as you said, future pandemics here. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Condike, I don't know if there's anything further you wanted to add from your perspective. Yeah, I'm really glad you're, you're highlighting this point, because I think the, the DFC is playing a crucial role, and... Um, we're seeing this across a few areas, as, as Gail has said, focusing on some of the immediate scale up of vaccine production that will serve us in this pandemic, but they're also looking for, for longer range deals that will serve us in future pandemics. Uh, it, it, we've clearly seen, and we've seen on Discord again uh, just recently with uh, the news out of India, that the need and the importance of diversifying the manufacturing base for vaccines so that uh, we don't just have all the vaccine production sitting in large countries that can absorb most of what they produce themselves, but we diversify it so that, um, so that, uh, so that it's more equitably available across the globe. Uh, DFC has also been providing some, uh, some financing tools to backstop and support the work of Gavi um, uh, that have been quite important to, uh, to their ability to secure uh, deals for, for new procurement. And they're also, you know, I, I just can't overstate how much the DFC has been leaning in to try and help also being willing um, on the on the kind of manufacturing inputs fronts and other areas where, you know, they're actively looking for deals to support that can do um, it can do anything to scale up vaccine and, and therapeutic and diagnostic production. So uh, very, very um, encouraging. And we have had a great relationship with them um, and great coordination. No, that, that's great to hear. I mean, I think that's a story that needs to be told more uh, on Capitol Hill and elsewhere in, in terms of, right. I, I think we're still trying to get a grip, you know, here on Capitol Hill about yeah. the fullness of the potential there with DFC and, and the areas in which it can be a force multiplier on so many different levels supporting you know, the work at the USAID and, and elsewhere. Uh, so Mr. Chairman, thanks for letting me take a second crack at it and then back to you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. And then I think our final second round question is gonna come from Representative Jacobs. Representative? Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair and uh, Jeremy and Gail. Thanks for, for staying for round two. Um, I know at uh, the end of my last question, we had short time. So I guess I just wanna reiterate how important I think it will be to have a clear view and understanding of the risk for pandemics and where they're likely to emerge, how the risk is changing the driver. So I would just, uh, 
you know, urge you to, to look into all the options, including that intergovernmental panel. And, and please know that that we here uh, will, will be allies uh, if that's something you choose to do. Uh, and I wanted to, to drill down um, a little more on USAID's strategy to deploy non-vaccine COVID assistance. Um, similar with other developmental assistance, I think it's important that we're devising these plans and deciding where to send our development dollars in as efficient and effective way as possible. And, and, you know, I think one of the best ways to do that is to consult with the communities who are set to receive the funds. So I was wondering if you could describe USAID's plan around consultation with local communities to understand their specific needs and how the agency is ensuring that our efforts are neither do do with our approach to vaccine work. Um, so, you know, as we've seen in, in our own country, as we've seen in other global vaccination campaigns, that local buy-in and local acceptance and local validation is crucial to uh, popular acceptance of uh, and confidence in vaccines. And so, you know, we're not going to get where we need to go on vaccine uptake if, um, if we don't have that local buy-in and, um, and so we'll be, uh, we're doing that in a few levels. We'll be doing that through our own programs to invest in vaccine confidence and support local voices and, and uh, empower and, and kind of elevate uh, credible local validators who can reach out to their own communities again, as we've uh, often done in this country as well. But we're also taking that to a macro level. Um, you know, th with the, the vaccine sharing that the U.S. is doing in, in Africa, we are not just unilaterally setting where those things are going to go. We're doing that in active consultation with the African Union, which has done the hard work of building political support across the continent for an African vaccine platform. And just earlier today, in fact, I was on a call doing uh, discussing that with the leaders of that platform. So we're trying to do this across a couple of levels because it is such an important issue to our ultimate success. Thank you. And that was all of my, my questions. Now, thank you, Representative Jacobs. All right. Well, thank you to all our witnesses for testifying today and the members uh, for joining us and asking these important questions. The issues that we discussed today are serious importance, not only to the United States, but also to the world. When a once in a century pandemic hits the world, there's no country better able to lead the international response and bring the world together against this common cause than the United States. We're only at the beginning of the fight to end COVID-19. And I look forward to working with the administration in this Congress on making substantive, durable progress. And with that, our subcommittee session is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.